At this time, you may go ahead and be seated. Thank you all for coming out today and uh, listening to Laura Kate as she is going to be delivering her oral. She's spent a lot of time preparing for this moment, and it is my opinion that she's going to do great. She senior assisted for me this past year in Algebra 2 and has done an awesome job in there. So I'm going to go ahead and open us in prayer, and then she will begin. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank for this day. I uh, thank you for the awesome weather that we have, and I thank you for Laura Kate. I thank you for the message that she has to give us, and I pray that you'll just calm her nerves as she delivers it, and you will bring to mind everything that she's prepared for and worked towards. In Christ's name I pray and ask it all. Amen. Everyone is familiar with the beloved story of Winnie the Pooh. Pooh Bear and his friends go on many adventures in the Hundred Acre Wood. Some of his friends include Piglet, Tigger, Eeyore, Kanga, Roo, and so on. Tigger and Eeyore are often compared for their di very different views on life and their personalities. Tigger is a fun, adventurous friend who always looks on the bright side, except for when Heffalumps and Woozles are involved. Eeyore is a gloomy, pessimistic donkey who is always just along for the ride because he has nothing better to do and cannot seem to keep up with his tail. Personally, I am more of a Tigger than an Eeyore. In trying to fully understand what optimism is, I, I thoroughly talked it out with philosopher and teacher Mr. Johnny Custer. We defined optimism as believing that good will prevail over evil. In Greek, optimism is asiodoxia. Asio comes from the word aeon, which means age eternity. Doxia means glory majesty. Together, this means eternal glory. The Bible points us to an eternal hope in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Optimism is an inherent part of the Christian message. The Bible is the most optimistic and pessimistic book of all time. Timothy Keller, Christian pastor and theologian, describes it as immediately pessimistic and eventually optimistic. What Keller means by this is that at first glance, you see the radical hopelessness of the gospel, but as you keep reading, the radical optimism begins to shine through. The Bible discusses many passages about how man is fallen and sinful. Ever since the fall, man has been separated from God. But God bridges or gives us the opportunity to bridge that separation by accepting him into our lives and repenting from our sin. As Christians, we do not have to we do not have to live out the pessimistic consequences of the Bible because we have everlasting life and abundant joy. Euangelion translates into good news gospel. In biblical Greek, these words are used interchangeably. This is because the gospel is our good news and our source of optimism. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 states, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality God with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This passage perfectly p depicts the picture of the gospel and Christ's mercy toward us as sinners. He came down as a servant, was crucified on the cross, but continually lived an optimistic life through it all. Jesus did not let the challenges of his everyday life affect the optimism and hope that he radiated to the world even knowing what his gruesome death entailed. In verse 5, we are called to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus in our relationships with one another. In this case, we are also called to hold on to optimism and live a life of optimism just as Jesus did. To Dr. Randall Smith, a professor of theology at the University of St. Thomas states, to truly embrace Christ, to truly have become a Christian, to believe in all the truth of Jesus coming, 
his death, and his promises of the future is to become an unstoppable optimist. As humans, we are stripped of purpose if we do not believe in life after death. Life without purpose leads to an existentialist mindset, making life completely meaningless. An existentialist life consists of continually going through the motions without any hope of a brighter future and ultimately no joy. In freshman year logic class, we learned about logical syllogisms. A logical syllogism is a valid deductive argument consisting of two or more premises and a conclusion. These premises must be true in order for the conclusion to be true. Revelation 17.14 reads, These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are the called and the chosen and the faithful. The Bible concludes that Christ will reign victorious and reclaim the world along with His faithful followers. With this information, we can conclude this syllogism. A. Christians believe in life everlasting and victory in Christ. B. Optimism is simply believing that good will prevail over evil. And C. Therefore, Christians can have optimism through the message of the gospel, even in the darkest circumstances. There are many counterarguments to the idea that, Christ or that optimism is an imminent part of Christianity. The first issue to address is that the gospel is not optimistic. People view the gospel as pessimistic due to the gruesome crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. They do not see the optimism hidden behind the flogging, the walk up the hill with the cross on his back, the nails piercing through his wrists and feet, and the slow asphyxiation on the cross. They focus on the negative aspects of this story instead of the grace and forgiveness being offered to us through his selfless, selfless actions and love. Another aspect people find pessimistic about the Bible is eternal damnation for sinners. These people dwell on the verses that's, that say that all sinners deserve death instead of the everlasting life you receive after accepting Christ into your life. They get caught up in the defeatist repercussions of hell and all that is within it. The gospel is pessimistic, but the optimism outshines the pessimism due to our everlasting hope. The second counter argument is that you can be an optimistic person and not be a Christian. Optimism comes in many shapes and forms. Non-Christian optimists heartily believe in the power of positive thinking. But where is their optimism coming from if it is not rooted in Christ? In this case, it is important to explain the difference between inherent optimism and limited optimism. Inherent optimism is a lasting joy and something to look forward to overall. Limited optimism is situational. The difference between inherent optimism and limited optimism goes hand in hand with the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is something, can be found in numerous ways, such as a simple smile or a yellow balloon. Joy is a lasting gift from the Lord. This lasting joy is where our inherent optimism can be found, which is also from the Lord. As stated in Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. The hope that this verse is referring to is the hope in which we may find our inherent optimism. Timothy Keller asserts, The optimism of the world never lasts. It is always based on things that change. Though you can be an optimistic person and not be a Christian, it is a limited optimism and will not fulfill you in the end. The final argument to consider is that Christians, that you can be a Christian and not be an optimistic person. These people know and believe that they will experience everlasting life, but struggle with holding on to optimism in their day-to-day -day life. They may understand God's goodness, but have trouble practicing it because they focus on the situational things of the earth instead of the inherent things. Oftentimes, our feelings start to take control of our minds and bodies. To combat these feelings, we must redirect ourselves to the truth in order that we may live with optimism. Some days, it is hard to believe that God knows us, thinks about us, and wants what's best for us. But He does, every single day. Psalm 139 proclaims how God knows humanity's actions before we do. 
He knows the words we are going to speak before they even leave our mouths, and he has predestined the number of days we are to be on this earth. Verse 17 reads, How amazing are your thoughts concerning me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Humans sometimes get trapped in a cycle of habitual sin. This continuous sin leads us to believe that we have no hope personally, even though we know God's goodness. In the book Love Does, Bob Goff writes, It's a reminder to me that God searches for us, no matter what, what dark place we're in or what door we're behind. Habitual sin is Satan working to drive Christians away from the intended path that God planned for us. Repenting of habitual sin and following and leaning on scripture will, will lead you down the path of righteousness, the individual path that God has prepared for his beloved. Although there is a time for everything, I believe in all situations you, may, you can find an optimistic outlook. A tricky concept that people often struggle with is holding on to optimism amongst trial. I know, much easier said than done. Often when people are in hardship, it is easy to sink into a dark place, but this only furthers the difficulty of the hardship. Taking away optimism strips away the hope that people would usually be clinging to in their trial. A personal example of how I've seen optimism lived out through trial is one of my friends from Young Life Capernaum. My friend Ricardo has a disability that that restricts him to using a wheelchair or a walker at all times. At camp this summer, there was a big swing that we encouraged the campers to do to face their fears and have fun while doing it. Unfortunately, this swing is not fully handicap accessible, so Ricardo did not get to participate. Instead, he sat at the edge of the gated swing area and watched his friends. Ricardo was not sad because he wasn't getting to go on the big swing. Ricardo was smiling and encouraging his friends to face his fears and rejoicing in their triumphs. He, was, he never stopped clapping and he never stopped cheering. Another influential example is Adoniram Judson, a Burmese missionary. After losing three children to illness and being imprisoned for almost two years, Judson's beloved wife Nancy and baby girl Maria died within six months of each other. This threw Judson into a spiritual darkness in which he secluded himself from the outside world. After, after reaching a new passion to, to reach out to the Burmese, Judson declared, The future is as bright as the promises of God. Judson did not stop pursuing Christ and being a missionary to the Burmese because he had the hope of seeing his children and wife again in heaven. Another person who spoke of this in length was Mr. Bob Fu, founder and president of China Aid. Mr. Fu gave me three points as to why or as to how the Chinese Christians continued to have optimism amidst persecution. One, Christians or one, persecution is expected in China. Two, amidst persecution, God's presence is always vivid, always there, and the love of Christ is manifested more explicitly. And three, Every time there's a new wave of persecution, there's a new opportunity to further the kingdom of God and share the gospel. Along with these points, Mr. Fu gave me the verse of 1 Peter 4.12, which reads, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. This verse, along with Mr. Fu's mentors, helped prepare him to face prison head-on with a spirit of optimism. Chinese Christians do not view persecution as a horrid experience that they need to escape. They take it as an opportunity to further the kingdom of God and spread the gospel. As Christians, we should not use trials and persecution as an excuse to take on a pessimistic outlook, as stated in 1 Peter 4.13. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Contrary to how some Christians may live, optimism is an inherent part of the Christian message. The Bible may not begin with an optimistic message, but the optimistic message prevails in the end. As we are called to live like Christ, so we are called to live with optimism.
Finding optimism in the gospel rather than in the temporal things of this earth will lead you to an everlasting hope in heaven. Our source of, optimi our source of optimism determines whether it is limited or lasting. Lasting optimism is found in Christ alone. Thank you. Well done, Laura Kate. Thank you. How does it feel to be done with the speech portion? Feels good. Yeah? yeah? You did well. So, start off with something a little bit light. <laughs> what are your plans um, after graduating from MCA? Um, I plan to gig them at Texas A&M University <laughs> and study petroleum engineering. That's, that's, that's all right, I guess. <laughs> no, that's exciting. So, getting into your oral, you talk obviously a lot about optimism and pessimism. Do you think that there is such a thing as false or misguided optimism? Yes. <clears throat> I think false or misguided optimism is like optimism that's not rooted in the gospel. Like the situational optimism or limited optimism that I was talking about. Okay, could you give us an example of what situational optimism might be? Um, well, I think like finding your optimism in other people would be a situational like way of saying it because other people can't always fulfill you and like you can't always meet other people's expectations so that will lead you to a false optimism. Okay, what about... Do you think there's such a thing as an optimism that's not rooted in reality? An optimism that's not rooted in reality? Like... So, for example, you have a student at MCA who is at a 75 in their class, and they're three weeks out, and they're thinking to themselves, oh, I got this. <laughs> I'll pull this together. <laughs> okay, do you think, you know, they're clearly optimistic about their chances but are they living in reality I would say they're not living reality if they think that they can make it both passing <laughs> okay so so optimism isn't strictly um, rooted in Christianity but it can apply to other facets of life just in how we approach um, our our daily situations yeah I think so okay so, we talk a lot about sharing truth here at MCA, okay, and one of the ways of sharing truth is, you know, once again, going back to that situation, saying, hey, here's where you, this is reality, this is, you know, where you're trying to get. Right. Okay, so we talk a lot about that. So, how does one optimistically communicate or receive a painful truth, such as maybe you're not going to pass this class. Well, you need to receive it like openly and like don't be closed off to it. Um, I think it'll be hard to hear, but like your your worth isn't found in that moment and in passing that class. It's ultimately found in your inherent optimism in the Lord. Okay, so on both sides, it's maybe communicating to the individual that, you know, this is reality. You're not going to pass the class, but that's not the end of the story. Right. It's right. not the end of the world if you don't pass. Like, there are other things to look forward to. Okay. Awesome. If, if optimism is an inherent part of the Christian message, why do so many of the Old Testament prophets seem so pessimistic in the messages that they give? So, for example, you have Jonah right? Jonah mm -hmm. is very pessimistic. He doesn't want to go out and, you know, preach God's message. He doesn't <laughs> want to give his word. And then you look at Elijah and Elijah goes and prays to God and says, well, God, I'm all you have left. Right? Right. Why do they seem so <clears throat> pessimistic? I think that's their selfish side coming out, their human side, because they're not focusing on what God wants them to do. They're focusing on themselves and that will lead them to pessimistic views. 
Okay. So if we define optimism as believing that good will prevail over evil, can we have a pessimistic outlook on the state of the world or the state of our country and yet be optimistic about what's eventually going to happen? I think you can because like a lot of people have a pessimistic view on our country today because that is our like our sinful earth that you're looking at. You can't have a pessimistic outlook on like the heaven that you're going to go to eventually. So you can have a pessimistic view on earth and like what is sinful, but like ultimately your optimism will lead you to like heaven. And so you don't have to have optimism in like all the sinful parts of the earth. Okay. So having a pessimistic outlook on the things of the world, is that really pessimism or might we turn that more as realism? <clears throat> I think it would probably be more realism because realism is like not knowing whether good or evil will prevail and I think um, people who are like having a pessim or what comes across as a pessimistic view is definitely being a realist because they don't know what will happen. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, Laura, Kate, you say you talk about in your oral about um, the Bible being. Is this on? Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, I thought I stopped. Are you turning back off? Okay. How about? <laughs> um. So you talk about the Bible being. You, you mentioned that the Bible is the most pessimistic book. Um, that's been written. So if that's the case, that the Bible is the most pessimistic book written, don't you think pessimism should be an inherent part of the Christian experience as well? I don't think so, no, because the Bible is the most pessimistic and optimistic book of all time. And um, the pessimistic side is, like, counteracted by the optimism, and the optimism, like, like definitely surpasses the pessimism. And what was the second part of your question? Just, do you think that pessimism should be part of the Christian experience? I think Since the Bible does talk about both. I think we'll all encounter pessimism, but um, if you like truly have optimism in like in Christ and what you're supposed to like be looking forward to, then I don't think pessimism will be a part of it. Okay. So we, we um, Mr. Nelson was talking about optimism and reality so how do you know that the optimism that you have is based in reality like how do you determine that <clears throat> like by reality like based in the world or like yeah how do you know like f like put it let me put it this way is optimi if the, is the optimism you have just naive do you have a naive type of optimism about life or how do you know that the optimism that you truly have is actually grounded in some type of reality? Well, I think we, if you're a Christian, you know that your optimism is grounded in reality because you know that Christ will reclaim the world in the end. So you can't, if that's not what you have your optimism in, then like you're probably not, then it's probably not based on reality. But if that is, then if that's where your optimism like stands, then it is. So what would you say to, like, critics of Christianity and those that would come and say, look at pain and suffering and trials that you had mentioned in your oral, mm -hmm. and they said to you, you're <coughs> actually just being naive and your head is in the sand and you don't e actually live in the reality of what's going on in your life, what would you say to, like, people who would critique you about that? Well, I think that's Satan trying to use other people to drive you away from your optimism, which ultimately drives you away from Christ. So, I mean, like, what would I say to them personally? Is that what you want to know? Um, I'd tell them, like, their point of view is different than mine, and my optimism lies in, like, the hope of a new world. So I can put my optimism wherever I want. <laughs> 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 All right, awesome. So you talk about somebody who is pessimistic, <coughs> and and you talk about those that are like 
um, living out that pessimism and just the way that they live their life. Do you see that being a major part of what goes on at MCA? Do you see a lot of pessimism at our school? Um, I don't, I would say I see more optimism than pessimism because MCA is like definitely like encouraging and like a safe place where you can be your best self or like your most honest self and so I don't see how like you can be so encouraging and be a pessimistic person so I would say no I think optimism prevails in MCA do you think that MCA has ways that they should improve on that or are they doing are we doing great on the optimistic and pessimistic scale? Yeah, I'm being op optimistic. Um, I mean, every there's always ways to improve. Um, do you want a specific wow, you sound way? really pessimistic right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I think one way that MCA could improve is like, I don't know, like tutors are very like relational with students and I'd I'd love like if that if they encouraged more like in our walks and like asked more personal questions about that um I think I would have like discovered a lot more in my walk personally if I had been pushed towards that direction like a little younger Great job, Laura Kate. Thank you. Um, you uh, said that you were a Tigger, right? I am. Okay, I believe that because you have a pretty <laughs> bubbly personality. Um, does optimism come naturally for you because you're a Tigger? Yes. <laughs> so is it just? So I'm I'm not a Tigger. Right. Um, <laughs> Got it. <laughs> you didn't have to say that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not what I meant. Yeah. Just dock your grade there. <laughs> so, uh, I, yeah, I would say I'm definitely an Eeyore. And, uh, yeah, I think Pharrell Williams' song, Happy, is just on repeat in hell. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can agree with you on that, actually. <laughs> so what would you say to someone like me, uh, who is an Eeyore? How do I find optimism? Well, it depends on, um, well, okay. I just want to say this. Pooh loves Tigger and Eeyore the same, even though they're different. Okay. <laughs> but, um. So God loves me even though. Yes, even though you're pessimistic. Even though I can't find my tail. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so what was your question? Sorry. Uh, how is... How is optimism acquired? How, how can an Eeyore, someone who's not naturally optimistic, find optimism in this life? Is this person a Christian or no? Yes, I'm a Christian. Okay. Well, <laughs> then if you're an Eeyore searching for optimism, like you need to turn to the Bible. And if you're not turning to the Bible, then you're just focusing on yourself, which is sinful and will never lead you to optimism. So is it sinful for me to be an Eeyore? Um, I, I don't think it's a... Yes, I actually... I think it's a sin because you're not living out the optimism that Christ offered to you. You're choosing yourself over him, over him instead. Thank you for that brave answer. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, a lot of suffering in in your paper is that is that being an obstacle to optimism and i i fully agree that it it, it is an optim uh, it, it is an obstacle to optimism uh, i've never personally experienced persecution uh, or really endured much suffering in life <coughs> um, but within that I, I can still find some plenty of other obstacles to to optimism, uh, whether that's just living a really comfortable, luxurious life, um, can limited optimism uh, be a hindrance to uh, inherent or transcendent optimism, as you described? I would say so, yeah. If you're focused on your, like, situational optimism all the time, you won't think about the inherent optimism that you, like, have deep down. So what <coughs> does it take for somebody who 
has a, a pretty comfortable life to step out of their limited optimism and and reach out for something higher what, what do they need um they need drive to pursue like the plan that god has prepared for us what is it what is it that helps them make to ch what is it that they need to help choose to have that drive to say i'm going to embrace this other i'm, I'm going to embrace god's offer and leave uh leave my limited optimism and i'm going to go pursue pursue christ i think realizing that your limited optimism isn't getting you anywhere is like a drive enough towards christ that it would push you towards that direction so back to that existentialism right it's just yeah. this is this is all you yeah. have mm -hmm. okay good i'll pass it back to mr nelson all right so everyone no matter how optimistic or pessimistic they may be everybody at some point in their life is going to have to deal with varying degrees of grief right <clears throat> so my question is is optimism present or can optimism be found in the midst of grief or is grief totally devoid of optimism i think optimism can be found in the midst of grief um personally like in the midst of grieving like I always found optimism in knowing that, like, that person was watching over me and, like, they were in that moment. And so I think you can have optimism in grief through that and knowing that you'll see them again. You can have optimism in that. But I think that, like, while you're grieving, you may not always, like, be smiling and, like, living optimism out expressively. Okay. You mention in your paper how the the chinese respond to persecution right? right and so it seems like they you know you said they expect it to happen and they look upon persecution as a means of actually being able to further the gospel more right, right? they have what you called an optimistic outlook on it why why do you think that Christians in China would have such a drastically different outlook on persecution than, say, we might. I think the Christians in China um, have more of a drive to be optimistic because they have, like, basically two options, either be persecuted um, for their faith or um, go see him go see Jesus in heaven. So, like, ultimately, they can be optimistic because it's one or the other. Um, they don't have to be scared because they're doing the work of the Lord. Okay. So if they're able to be optimistic, you know, in the midst of that really, honestly, I would say difficult decision, what's holding us back, you know, as, as people living in the United States, what's holding us back from really being able to live optimistically? Because we're not undergoing persecution. You know, we have life a lot easier than the you know the majority of the rest of the world why is it so hard for us to be optimistic i think it's hard for us to be optimistic kind of like how mr schumann said like we get stuck in our comfort zones and so we like begin to follow our own ways of life instead of following god's and so we just get trapped in our own selfish ambition okay so the focus is on self right. not god mm -hmm. okay so for anyone who uh, knows you and has heard this topic, I think they would think it's appropriate that uh, you would be talking about this, given your optimistic nature. <laughs> um, how do you practice optimism in your life? In any situation? Yeah, just in your life. How do you maintain such a tigger outlook on life? Well, I think... It's easier for me to be optimistic because I don't like I don't like hearing the pessimistic point of view because it's just sad. And so it's easier for me to be optimistic and spread that optimism rather than like everyone being sad. And like I know like if I'm sad, being optimistic and happy to someone else like makes me feel better because I know it's making a difference in their lives. So is that how you um, cope with the moments when you're not optimistic? 
you cope with those by encouraging others or how do you deal with the times when you're not feeling very optimistic? Um, yeah, I'd say in the times where I don't feel optimistic, um, I seek comfort in friends that are also optimistic and then I use that comfort and I guess it kind of just turns into like encouraging others because that always makes me feel better about like where I am. Okay. How do you, how would you say you come alongside somebody who's in a very dark place in their life and encourage them to have an optimistic outlook? On the situation well I think first of all it would take some like brutal truth but um, but then if you just continue to live life optimistically and lead by example and then encourage them to do so as well I think they can get there but what happens a lot of time when you share that brutal truth with somebody so if you come alongside somebody they're going through something you say ah this is just situational right it'll be over before you know it Okay, oftentimes I feel like people don't respond to that very well. So okay. what, you know, how do you communicate to them? Well, you have to do it in a loving way and know that and like let them know that you're doing it for their best interest and not for your own. Okay. Do you think that situational problems or situational issues that can lead to pessimism? Do you think that um, if you just leave those alone for long enough, they can turn into bigger problems down the road that affect their life. Will you say that one more time? Yeah, so um, you say that pessimism is based around uh, looking at the situational things, right? Mm -hmm. So if we just ignore the situational things because that's pessimistic, can that create bigger problems for us down the road by just not addressing those? I would say so. It'll just snowball into one big pessimistic situation. <laughs> okay, and it'll just blow up later. Right. Okay. So, based on your knowledge of optimism, pessimism, and realism, as well as Winnie the Pooh, I know Mr. Schumann declares himself an Eeyore, but which characters would you say best fit the members of your panel? Characters from, from Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh. Okay. Well, Adams is a tigger. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd say you're an Eeyore, and <laughs> <laughs> and I would say Mr. Schumann is um, owl. Owl. Why owl? Owl is very wise, and Mr. Schumann is very wise. <laughs> Good response. I think you got those points back from him. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, obviously, you know that I'm like a tigger. Mm -hmm. I know that and, very uh, well. <laughs> that's why we're kindred spirits, I think, right? <laughs> yes. But what would you say to someone who says that um, it's your natural disposition to be that way? Like for me, I wake up in the morning, I'm like, good morning, ready to go. And some people, they wake up in the morning and they're like, it's probably going to rain today. That was Why really good. Why did you wake me up? You know, and just, you know, and that's just how they start the day. You know, not even necessarily have they thought through a lot of the situations in their life. So what would you say about that, that it's just sometimes people's natural disposition I'll call it personality to be that way well actually when I was on the phone with Bob Goff he said this because I asked him I was like have you always been optimistic and he said yep I came out that way so I think like optimism and pessimism is like partly in your personality but that's just when you wake up and you haven't really started your day so once you start focusing like your energy on something I think that's when you can really like decide oh I'm gonna be optimistic today or I'm gonna be pessimistic so how do you help somebody who is has the more Eeyore tendencies um, to you know how do you help them when they they feel like 
man, I just have a disposition to be more pessimistic. Do you have any, like, just for everyday life? I mean, he mentioned more, like, serious situations of, of dealing with that. But right. how, how would you do that? Um, I would say, okay, so you, there's the two circles, the me circles, right? And there's one that has the arrows that go in and are pointing at you. And mm-hmm. then the other one has the arrows pointing out, right? And I'd say... Um, when you choose to be pessimistic, you're choosing to point everything towards you and be selfish about it. And if you choose to be optimistic, you're using the arrows going out and like using your optimism to affect others. And so I'd say like picking pessimism over optimism is choosing, um, yourself over others. Do you think that sometimes the more pessimistic people could have some good insight into life sometimes? Like, for example, I Googled Eeyore quotes for this oral. And one of them I got from Eeyore was this. He says, weeds are flowers, too, once you get to know them. (laughs) So that's one of the quotes from Eeyore, right? And so he talks about even though it's pessimistic, he brings a different perspective to something that otherwise most people would see as worthless. So do you think that sometimes the pessimistic side can have some value into our lives? Yeah, I think it definitely has value. I think it kind of brings out, like, perspectives that you would have never seen before. So how do you balance that between, like, it being sinful and that being just like, yes, this is an adequate perspective I can have on life? Well, I think... In that case, it's not a pessimistic, like, that pessimism isn't based on yourself, which is, like, usually when it becomes sinful. Um, That pessimism is based on, like, the overall concept. And so I think it becomes sinful whenever it's based on yourself and, like, becomes selfish, and that's what makes it sinful. So you mentioned that about people who are pessimistic. Um, in your oral and it says these Christians are focused on situational things instead of inherent things right and you say they may understand God's goodness but they don't practice it Mm -hmm. so what exactly do you mean by they don't practice God's goodness what does that mean to practice God's goodness so they like know like Christ and like his personality and like how he lived but they don't um like Imble, or what I don't know what that word is like resemble God's characteristics and like try to live like him because they get caught up in themselves so they have trouble practicing like God's goodness because they are like not worried about it as much because they're worried more about themselves so if they un- do they really truly understand God's goodness if they don't live out in light of that or is it a, a just a head knowledge or intellectual knowledge at what what level are are we are you saying that they understand god's goodness um i definitely say it's a head knowledge and i think yeah i'd say it's a head knowledge until you decide to live it out so they like know it and believe it but they are having trouble like like doing it Hmm. so you mentioned then that continuous sin leads these Christians to continue to believe that there's no hope for them personally, even though they know God's goodness. What do you mean by no hope? Like, what what do you mean they have no hope towards what? Sorry, what what was that? So the quote was, um, you're talking about those who are sometimes get trapped in habitual sin, and you say this continuous sin leads some Christians to believe that there's no hope for them personally, even though they know God's goodness. Um, so are you talking about no hope for salvation, eternal life, or what do you, can you just explain to me what you mean by hope? Right, there? yeah, so like in that case, the people who are like caught in their continuous sin, like start, like they convince themselves like, oh, I can't stop doing this, I am not good enough, I can't go to heaven, um, and so like that's the hope I'm talking about, they lose the hope of like their eternal salvation, even though they know like they have accepted Christ and they know God. So would you say it's a mischaracterization of your oral to say that if someone is pessimistic, then that means there must be habitual sin in, in their life? Um, I wouldn't say that someone's 
some wait will you say that one more time yeah would you say it's a mischaracterization of your oral to say that just because someone has is pessimistic then ergo therefore that they must have habitual sin in their life i don't think pessimism always goes hand in hand with habitual sin because i think pessimism can be found in other areas and habitual sin just will eventually lead you to that Hmm. So, I mean, I think you're right that this is like a serious issue with a lot of people that do have habitual sin in their life. They come to that point where they feel like they do lose hope of their salvation. Right. And they do feel like I'm no longer a Christian because a Christian wouldn't be practicing or continue doing this um, type of whatever sin it is. What would you say then? How do you help someone with that? Because that's deep seated, right? That's like a, a major issue in their life. Mm-hmm. How do you help them when you, when they're like, well, I just keep doing it over and over again? Um, I think it's definitely a process. You have to like encourage them um, to go away from that sin. And then I also think like praying for them obviously is always a good way um, to help and like just praying that they realize it themselves because I don't think you can ever – like fix your habitual sin until you realize it and like realize that it's a problem. Excellent. You know, I also, I, I found another who Winnie the Pooh quote and he says one day Pooh says, I don't feel very much like Pooh today said Pooh there, there said Piglet. I'll bring you tea and honey until you do. And so what I like about that is sometimes like, Mr. Nelson was talking about is like situations where you're going through trials and hardship and or you feel like man I got habitual sin and I can't help it sometimes I think the best thing is that if you come alongside someone like that and willing to listen to them and be with them and share them and not always saying well you're just looking at limited optimism (laughs) but sometimes just being there with people like makes a huge difference and so Lord Kate uh I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Schumann, but before I go, um, I just wanted to say to you that um, uh, it's been my privilege to teach you these four years. It's been fun having you as a student and getting to know you. Um, It's really been been an awesome experience for me. I'm super proud of you and where you're going in your life. And so I just wanted to end with this quote from Winnie the Pooh again. (laughs) If ever there is a tomorrow... When you are not, when we're not together, and there's something you must always remember, you are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, smarter than you think. But the most important thing is, even if we are apart, I'll always be with you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, almost done. Home stretch is. What's the role of faith and inherent optimism? <clears throat> I don't think I think if you don't have faith, then you don't have inherent optimism. You have some other kind like limited. Okay. So you so you're without faith you're limited to limited optimism. Right. Okay. Good. Is joy a virtue or is joy a fruit? Hmm. Um, I think joy is a fruit. Okay, why? Um, because I think joy comes out of being virtuous. Um, I hope that wasn't like a contradiction, but, um, so I think like you receive joy out of, out of different ways. And so like, um, following Christ is being virtuous and you receive joy from doing that. So. Good. Um, my last question for you, uh, since you mentioned uh, pursuing Christ, is during your time at MCA, um, you started in seventh grade? Yes, sir. Okay, so during, um, during your time here at the upper school, how have you engaged minds, pursued Christ, and discovered greatness? Um, okay, I'd say there's probably two ways. Um, I think... MH projects definitely like 
they engaged my mind a lot. Um, and then the Socratic method also did that. But then I think pursuing Christ and discovering greatness for me at MCA, I, f- I found that a lot in sports and um, like on the basketball court and through tennis and just like team bonding, I guess. I um, like we discovered greatness as a team and learned how to work together. Um, and then also like relationships, like those relationships relationships helped me to pursue Christ more um, and like pursue him through sports and like have a good attitude and stuff like that. I'm glad to hear you say that because that, I think that really matches a lot of what you've been talking about in your oral. Um, and it's that joy and optimism. It's Yes, there's a limited amount of understanding that you can have with that, but it's really learned just by doing it, by choosing it, and by living it. And um, I mean, anybody that's watched you, and I unfortunately haven't been able to have you in any classes during your time here, but just through just the way you carry yourself walking in the resource center or uh, on the basketball court, I mean, you're you're always beaming, and uh, you are a gospel um, to to Christ through the way that you live your life. And so keep keep letting your light shine um even someone that that has a limited relationship with you on that and so um it's you're an inspiration uh to me in that so thank you thank you Um, and and it's my prayer that you'll continue to do that as as you go off to aggie land (laughs) because they don't have any joy there (laughs) (laughs) all right it's your turn to to fire away at us okay um so I'd say this goes along with optimism because it's like joy. But um, what is like a situation or event in where you felt the most joy you've ever felt? Or happiness. Yeah, that's for everyone. It's a free for all. Um, well, happiness uh, when the Astros won the World Series <laughs> a couple of years ago. Uh, but the the joy it it's easily just kind of with my kids. Um, and uh, I mean, my kids are a lot of fun. They're a lot of work, and they've got a lot of energy. Um, but just getting to to do life with Laura. Um, in the midst of all the the busyness and the tired and what have you, um, I mean, we we hardly get to see each other anymore. Uh, it <laughs> feels like, and so I mean, it's like each day kind of ends with, "I'm exhausted. Um, it's so tiring. You were awesome today. Way to go." <laughs> um, uh, and but in the midst of all of that, uh, there's a lot of joy just through our kids growing up and getting to be a part of that and investing in them. Um, and so that I mean, that's recent ongoing stuff but um but that's that's a season of joy that that is is real thank you <clears throat> so as some of you may know me and my wife had to date long distance for four years all throughout college uh, and so that uh that was obviously not easy and so i think when we were finally able to get married and permanently be together um i'd say that was when i felt the most joy well i'm not married nor do i have (laughs) nor do i have kids (laughs) i'm aware (laughs) so my greatest joy is yet to come (laughs) No. (laughs) no i mean i'll be honest i have had great joy in my life being single and God has like led me to a lot of different places to be able to minister in Nigeria and China and many places in the United States. Um, I've had great joy in my life. I don't regret anything or I don't regret that I'm still single or I don't have kids, but some of the greatest joy in my life is having nephews and getting to love on them. But like it's huge joy in my life to see my own family and my brother, my sister and my folks who are all in ministry and walking with the Lord. Because you walk, look around in our society and so many people are 
come from broken homes and people that don't walk with the Lord. And so like that gives me constant joy. Um, just having to like have my family that walks with the Lord together. That's good. All right. So you're done. So at this point in time, I know the Sparks family would like to invite all of you to uh, go over to discovery at the conclusion of the oral and partake in ice cream and cake in celebration of Laura Kate. And so I will ask Mr. Adams to pray for us and we will be dismissed. God, we just thank you that you are the great God that creates all people. And we thank you for creating this Tigger here and the excitement that she has for life and the joy and the optimism that she brings and how much she has encouraged and strengthened our community MCA, her own family, her own church, this community, God. We just thank you for all that you've done in her life and we've watched her up to this point. God, we're excited about what you're continually doing right now in our own life, and our own heart. And Lord, we just look forward to the great things that you're going to use her for to advance your kingdom, advance your gospel. As, like she talked about in her oral, turning away from herself and focusing on others and pushing them closer to you. And she's just such a great testimony example to us of that. So we pray that her life will continually pattern and show that to the rest of the world. And so we pray all these things in the precious and the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.